Sure. Hey guys, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a quick volume check, not too loud. Good? Okay. So uh, my name is Mike Rago, um, and with me uh, is Domingo. Um, I'll let him introduce himself in a second. Um, but we're going to do a presentation on uh, uh, bring your own risky apps and talk about um, some of the threats that come about from the apps that we use each and every day, especially from an enterprise perspective. And we're going to give you a lot of good examples, a um, little bit of code reviews and things like that as well. And um, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Did you want to add anything, Domingo? Or? Just our contact info is on the first slide. Feel free to shoot us a tweet or an email. And uh, we'll take questions, I guess, towards the end so we can get through the content. So I don't really want to spend too much time talking about myself, but we will have some other uh, presentations at some other shows throughout the week uh, around uh, data hiding and steganography and things like that, which is something I do a lot of research in. Um, also we do uh, a presentation around the iOS attachment vulnerability and giving some examples of that. Uh, and then also mobile network forensics for those of you guys on the forensics side. Uh, so look for us at some of the other shows, uh, as well as B-Sides, of course. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Domingo. And most of my main interests are around mobile applications, so security, privacy, both for protecting corporate data, but also protecting consumer data, personal data. Both of those worlds are now intermingled. So we publish quite a bit of research on what we find from popular apps perspective. We work with developers, and we also work with the enterprise and with the app stores as well. How can we increase the level of security and privacy that affect us all when we're using mobile devices? Great. So I think most people are familiar with Mobile Iron. Just one quick slide on who we are and what we do. Uh, we certainly um, kind of stemmed from the mobile device management world and now have gotten into securing and managing apps and content. So. Uh, in the theme of you old school folks and Dan Farmer and, and people like that, um, <clears throat> you know, really getting a good understanding of the behaviors in this case uh, that stem from a lot of the apps that we use each and every day to understand what type of exfiltrations may be happening, what type of uh, data loss um, vectors may be occurring, uh, what kind of PII information uh, is being accessed or exposed uh, from an enterprise perspective. Uh, and how that impacts the devices that you're using uh, in the enterprise network, in the enterprise environment, cloud services, and so forth. So in terms of what we do is a monitoring a lot of that type of activity, analyzing that activity, reverse engineering that activity to better fortify the networks that our customers are using day to day. So it's, de it's a lot more than just the device. It's definitely around web apps and, and content. So in terms of some of the things that we analyze, and we're going to hit a few rock layers here and dig deeper and deeper. You know, I think you're going to hear Domingo talk a lot about not only malicious apps, but uh, ideally even perhaps more important, uh, risky apps for those apps, again, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we'll, we'll both kind of do a breakdown of some examples of some popular apps. Uh, Domingo has some really good examples. I'll just kind of review a little bit about uh, some of the own analysis that you guys can do with some free and available tools, and then we'll talk about some of the deeper analysis that AppThority does as well. In terms of jailbreak and root, I'm sure we're all familiar with that in iOS and Android. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about some of the analysis and detections we do around that to not only detect those threats, but also mitigate them as well. I think what's really important is that um, many times if a device goes lost or stolen and it contains some sensitive data on it, what happens if that device falls off the network? It's great that you can do a detection around a jailbreak or a root, but if that doesn't get notified back to the console, how does it perform a selective or a full wipe? We'll talk about that and we'll talk about some uh, additional techniques that we use at Mobile Iron for handling that situation. Um, and then uh, certainly some of the other mobile attacks, and again, this is very much related to apps, uh, as well as the device, are those device and app intents. So while although the mobile operating systems tend to be very sandboxed in terms of some isolation amongst the apps, there's still those intents, those capabilities that allow you to copy, paste, open in, file, upload, and things like that. 
And then we also take a close look on an ongoing basis at, from a network perspective, in terms of, hey, you know, we know that users are going to travel. And when they travel, they're going to probably connect to open Wi-Fi. It's difficult to lock that down and protect against that, right? So <clears throat> we use a lot of mitigating techniques to basically thwart various types of attacks that may stem from interception, man-in-the-middle attacks, and things like that, too, which we'll recap at the end. So at the end of the day, we're looking at the user, the device, and the network. Uh, just as Michael mentioned, we focus a lot on malware analysis and finding out overall risk, but we found that in the enterprise specifically, after analyzing over 2.5 million apps, we found less than half a percent of apps have malware. So really, what's the risk? What's the impact? It's apps we use every day. Apps in the top 100, apps in the top 200 of free and paid apps on iOS and Android that are just not built correctly or are over-provisioned, over-collecting information and over-sharing information with third parties. So I'll focus on the, a little bit of both, both of those examples. Um, in addition, the other thing that we commonly see is a lot of administrators that certainly understand the threats that come about by performing um, a jailbreak or a root of the device in that you're kind of breaking that application sandboxing, you're kind of breaking down that security that is built into the device. I think what some of the users um, don't always realize is that, you know, not only, you know, is the device vulnerable, but it can be vulnerable on the network on which it's connected. So if you are allowing jailbroken or rooted devices, um, and that user's traveling and they connect to an open Wi-Fi, you know, what's the default login on an iOS device if it's jailbroken? Okay. It's root with a password of Alpine. So if the user hasn't gone ahead and actually changed the password and they simply jailbroke their device and downloaded some additional plugins and things like that, that's sitting on an open Wi-Fi network, somebody could easily secure shell into their iOS device and log in with the default username and password of root and a password of Alpine. So I think that's something that a lot of administrators are not always aware of and certainly just lends credence to the fact that, you know, it certainly represents a, a threat on the network. So let's dig a little bit deeper. In terms of analyzing apps, there's certainly a plethora of different tools available out there. Uh, anytime I do presentations on forensics and data hiding and analysis and so forth, I always try to focus on free and available tools. So if you're using ADB, if you're using some of those other tools that are freely available uh, that you can use for uh, Android to uh, uh, connect in uh, through the debugger, you can actually leverage a free tool called APK tool to actually um, dig a little bit deeper into a specific APK. Um, or a specific uh, um, app that you want to analyze, in this case, on Android. This will allow you to expose the Android manifest and look at it in more detail to see what kind of permissions is that app using. And is that really correlate to, you know, the intentions of the actual app? So, for example, this one is kind of a, a, a wallpaper app. And if you take a look at some of the analysis here, you know, it's actually collecting location information that stems from an algorithm that is a combination of uh, either the cell tower and or the Wi-Fi information. So as you start to take a look, a deeper look at some of these, you know, free and available apps that are out there uh, on Google Play, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, what kind of information might be exposed from this? Because unquestionably, if you go by NIST, you know, in the special publication 800-53, it references PII information. That is PII information, okay? And that's an app that freely available and available in Google Play. If I actually uh, root my Android device, you know, what are the details in terms of what's occurring with that root? Certainly, there are a lot of different rooting techniques on Android. Um, in contrast to iOS in terms of jailbreak, but what exactly, what kind of information stems from rooting the device? And by using APK tool to break down that app, to break down that APK and reveal the Android manifest, indicates here that it can write to the external storage, your SD card. 
Additionally, uh, it can open a socket and network connectivity, which could lead to a plethora of attacks, right? Anything from remote command and control, exfiltration, backdoors. And then in addition to that, the actual network state, and that could be quite revealing if you're using a VPN um, or a per app VPN to connect back to the corporate network. But it's more than static analysis, it also includes dynamic analysis. So if I'm analyzing the behavior of the app from a network perspective, and I'm wire running Wireshark or something else, I can engage the app for a variety of behaviors to determine is it encrypting the traffic? Is it encrypting the data that it's transmitting? Is it providing a secure tunnel? Well, other information may be exposed. So in this particular app, I selected, hey, you know, I, I forgot my passcode for the app itself. Uh, would you kindly send that to me? And sure enough, not only did it send it to me, but it sent it to me in clear text. Didn't provide a way to reset it. It simply just sent me that, that passcode. So who's monitoring the airwaves? Did you do that on an open Wi-Fi? Did somebody else capture that information as well? So if you look more broadly at all of the Android manifest permissions, you'll clearly see that there's certainly a lot that overlap with PII and sensitive information that you obviously, from an enterprise perspective, would not want to expose. And so these are the many things that we look at from uh, an app perspective. I'll do a quick introduction on AppThority. Uh, we started the company in early 2011, really to be able to identify hidden risks in mobile apps. Early on, we focused on malware analysis and realized that the enterprise didn't have a big malware problem, mostly because they were heavy on iOS. And as a result, we added more engines to our software to also automate the analysis from a static, dynamic, and behavioral perspective to look at other types of risks. We let our customers dictate what behaviors are allowed or not in their protocols or in their environments. And they can set policy to say, let my engineers access anything, but for my finance folks, make sure there's no apps that communicate without encryption. For my executives, I don't want them location tracked when they're traveling, things like that. So we automate the workflow. We hook in directly to the MDM, in this case, Mobile Iron, and we're able to see the apps that are discovered on the device. And this next slide will show really how we can work together to provide an end-to-end -end solution. So from Mobile Iron, we can see all the apps installed on the mobile devices. Then from our database of over 2.5 million analyzed apps, we can match those apps to apps we've already analyzed or collect those apps for analysis. So go purchase them from the App Store automatically, download them, install them, do a disassembly, do static analysis, run them on an emulator or on a hardware device, and do runtime dynamic analysis as well. We then create a policy on our portal where, again, it can be by user or by device type, and then do the enforcement through Mobile Iron and the remediation through a collaboration of Mobile Iron and Authority. So it's a way for our, both of our companies to collaborate to solve this problem of privacy and security of apps, especially third-party apps in the enterprise. So we promised a short demo, wanted to see any iPhone users here, Android, jailbroken Android, uh, jailbroken iOS, I guess rooted Android, jailbroken iOS. Uh, anyone play Flappy Birds? So Flappy Birds was pretty popular for a while and then the developers pulled it from the App Store. So we wanted to see what can happen with a targeted version of Flappy Birds. On the left we have the target device we're able to see that it has some accounts there. On the right, we have the hacker's device or the clone device empty. So we'll go in and there's no settings there. There's nothing in there, the accounts. So my friend missed Flappy Birds. So I emailed him a copy of Flappy Birds saying, hey, don't worry, it's not in the App Store, but here's an APK. Because he trusts me, shouldn't have, he's going to install uh, the APK directly to his phone. So again, it's not going from the official App Store. The app was no longer available. Um, I checked the Gmail's account. They have an account on the left side. The right side of this phone is native, so there's no account there. And I'm going to send them the email saying, don't worry, here's a version of, Angry, of Flappy Birds. Download it, play it, you, you'll, you'll have fun. So he's going to scroll down. Apologize for the view, but it's a small window. But scroll down, read my message recommending the app, uh, install the APK. And he doesn't know that it's a Trojanized version of the APK. So it asks the same permissions, it looks the same, it has the same dynamic size, the same package, uh, just not the official version. When he installs it, 
we'll have a little sub bullets of as the app is doing something. Again, it's a research app, so we wanted to show what we're stealing. But we're targeting Google, specifically Gmail, and we're targeting bypassing the dual authentication of the two-step verification. Um, we're running the app. Again, it takes a little bit to load, but as soon as it loads, we're going to see on the bottom the information as I'm getting it. So I got his Tinder profile because he had the Tinder app. Uh, I got his Gmail. I got his GitHub profile, E-Trade, anything that's set under accounts or set under the, the user's statistics we're able to get and transmitting it to our server. I'm not very good at Flappy Birds, but I managed to get farther than I've ever gotten when I was recording the demo. Uh, it's actually a lot harder than it looked at first uh, case. So keep holding your breath. I'm almost there. Uh, I think I made it around four or five. Yeah. OK. So that was Flappy Birds. Played it, done with it. Cool. Meantime, the data has already been harvested. It's been sent to a third-party network. We're going to go to the clone device and run our Harvester app which downloads that profile and downloads all of the account details. Now, it's going to take a while, so I'm, I'm fast-forwarding through part of the demo because it takes a while to load, and I have to reboot the device to load that profile. But it's downloading, again, the Google uh, two-step authentication tokens, the account credentials, and from there I can access not just the Gmail, but the calendar, anything on the device that the other person had. Again, fast-forwarding through this, I think we have few more seconds. But we start seeing now the backgrounds loaded. Um, keep fast forwarding a little bit more. Again, importing. Uh, we've done this not just with Gmail, but with GitHub. So source code from the company, uh, Salesforce information, uh, dating apps, profile, social networking, social hacks as well. But I uh, wanted to show Gmail since that's kind of an app that a lot of us use, and it's something we could all understand. Um, reboots the device now, loading those tokens, uh, they're still within the window where they haven't expired. So you're able to go directly into Gmail, not have to authenticate, not have to do the two-factor, because it's keeping all of those credentials. And this clone device doesn't realize that it's a clone device. It thinks it's the real account. It thinks it's still the real device. Um, here we go. Uh, have Gmail now. Um, when we go into settings, we'll be able to see that now there is a settings, an account set for Google. There wasn't one before. A little bit slow, but it's getting there. Scroll down a bit. So we see a Gmail account has been imported onto the device now. And then when we go back home to the home screen and open the Gmail app, we'll be able to see, read the user's emails, be able to send emails from there as well. It's not a very fast uh, emulator, but it's working. And again, most of the, the use case around here is on a targeted attack. If you know what attack accounts you're looking for, you can program it like here for Gmail. But on the non-targeted attack, you can just import all the accounts and then do it twice. First, see which accounts came in and then preload those apps so that when you reboot the device, those accounts will be imported correctly. We're able to see now Kevin's email already loaded up. I was able to access then his email directly from this clone uh, device. So that's great. That's malware that we wrote, or that's kind of spyware or malware. But when, and that's mostly what IT professionals and security professionals worry about when they think about mobile security. But then when we look back to the hard data, again, been in business since 2011, analyzed over 2.5 million apps, less than half a percent of the apps in corporate environments have malware. But about 81% of apps had issues, security issues and concerns. It's not bad people making bad apps with, like with malware. It's good people making bad apps. They're either insecure programming practices, they're using bad third-party tools and SDKs, or they're trying to monetize too aggressively. They're harvest, harvesting too much data, trying to sell it to different third parties like advertising networks, analytics frameworks, even social networking sites, and then profiting off the users. Less than 20% of apps we look at in general would pass a traditional enterprise-grade security test. So just released this week, we announced our app reputation report, which we publish every six months. We looked at the top 400 iOS and Android apps, both free and paid. 
So we'll do a side-by-side -side of iOS and Android for free and then for paid. In terms of what data was being collected, location tracking is something that's been common for a while. More than half, more than 50% of the apps now location track, whether they need to for function or not, because the ad networks will pay more money if you give them localized data on users than if you just give them user data. Next, ad network, sorry, access address books. That's something that we've seen increase quite a bit. Sometimes it's just read on the device, but sometimes it includes exporting the address books as well. In the enterprise side, we've seen a big increase in corporate spam as mobility has increased because users are sharing not just their personal address book, but their whole company address book if they sync with Outlook, for example. So now you're giving away phone numbers, emails, and mailing addresses of folks in the company, and it leads to more phone calls into people's desks. Calendars has actually is the only thing that decreased year over year from last year. We saw LinkedIn get in trouble for accessing calendars without notifying users on iOS. And when they removed calendars, they were taking meeting minutes, call-in information, any attachments that were there could be confidential information, and data mining it. Now iOS 7 requires permission to use the calendar, but still, a lot of our users in the enterprise will give permission to anything, right? They just click, okay, 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 there goes our calendars as well. IMEI is interesting in the sense that it's, especially with UDID, it's a cookie that you can never delete. So even if you're using different logins to diff for different apps, if it's tied to the UDID, they know it's you across all your app traffic. And now if you marry that with the, the next slide, who is receiving the data? If you marry that with the analytic frameworks, even if it's just IMEI or even if it's a temporary device ID now that Apple offers that, they can still identify who the user is based on their traffic across multiple applications. So it's not just one developer getting your information or your user's information. It's now a pool of developers that have access to these analytics frameworks and do data sharing with them. Advertising networks expected on free apps. If you don't pay for the app, you are the product or your data is the product. Social networking, especially with now single sign-on with Facebook, you can sign in to any app or over 70% of the apps on Android using Facebook, but that just increases the number of third parties that are collecting user data and sharing user data and device data. And then cloud and files, sorry, cloud and file storage has been growing a lot. A lot of our customers worry about Dropbox. They're trying to prevent rogue IT where folks come in and, and save corporate documents directly on Dropbox. So using an MDM or using the firewall, they might block Dropbox.com or they might drop, block the Dropbox app. But there's thousands of apps that have a backend connection, an SDK or an API connection to Dropbox directly from the app. So if, if they just focus on the Dropbox app, they're going to miss a lot of it. I'll speed up a little bit, but just to show on the paid side, we were surprised. Again, the behaviors are still found pretty often. In-app purchases, still pretty big on free and paid. I know there's a lot of controversy in Europe where the government wants uh, Apple and Google to not call the apps free if they have in-app purchases because it ends up not always being free. But also ad networks on paid apps, almost 50%, sorry, uh, here we go for ad networks. Uh, almost 40% are still using ad networks even though the app is paid. So you might not see an ad surface, you might not see a pop-up, but there's still an ad network in the background that's collecting information, harvesting the data, and then selling it to data brokers. So from this perspective, paid apps were a little bit safer than free apps, but they're still leaking a lot of information. Next, I wanted to just say, okay, what are the top five failures that developers are making in general? Again, these are good people making bad apps. It's not malicious intent. It's not malware. There's other solutions that we were doing to help combat malware, but this is a bigger issue because it impacts every app, not just malicious apps. But using poor or bad third-party SDKs, and I'll show some examples, permission abuse, which we see a lot, improper handling of private data, terrible cryptology, cryptography, and then airing dirty laundry. A lot of developers keep personal or development information on the app. I'll show some examples as well. So a lot of times we find a risky app, we publish it, and the developer contacts us and says, hey, no, we're not doing that. And we show them the analysis, and in fact they are, but they did it through an SDK. They didn't even know the SDK was doing that. So this is a very popular SDK for adware. It's very aggressive, and it violates COPA, which is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. A lot of developers can get in trouble for this directly with the government that's starting to find folks for this, even without their knowledge. So if any developers out there, just keep an eye out for this. Um, quick example of just the amount of data that this SDK was collecting. 
It's taking your zip code, your phone number, your app ID, app key, IMEI, okay, maybe fine. But now if you go down to the bottom, it's getting the user's age, which now is PII. If it's anyone under 13 uh, and you don't have a privacy policy, you could get fined for this, for something your ad network did, not even the developer did themselves. The, the city, the state, the latitude, longitude, so location of the user. Again, the more information the developer collects, the more they get paid. So there's kind of a reverse incentive towards privacy and security. But as users, we need to raise awareness that we shouldn't just accept all permissions and push back. We have seen some improvements on calendar access as users push back on that. So if we push back on the other behaviors, we might see some improvement there. Other issues with permissions, sometimes there's an underprivileged application that tries to sidestep the permission. I'll show an example of a big bank that does that on the next page. Uh, over Overprivileged over applications, some developers, they're lazy and they say, okay, give me every permission and that way if I ever need it, I'll have it. Or if I need it in a future functionality, I won't have to add it again. And the problem with the confused deputy that says, you're, you, you also have to guard your application from other apps that might try to leverage your permissions. So if your application has permission to send text messages, for example, and another application doesn't, but you can communicate with that application, specifically on Android, that application could submit a request through your app to send a text message. So which app really did the send mes the messaging and which one had the permission? So that's something we look for on Android as well. But it's more on the under permissioning. A lot of applications don't have permission for location tracking because to use GPS, now both Apple and Google require you to let the user know. But they found a lot of ways to do location tracking based on GeoIP or Wi-Fi, cell phone triangulation. So in the example of E-Trade for both iOS and Android, even if you don't give permission for location tracking, they can still know where you are based on your IP address, based on your, on your mobile IP address. So no permission given, behavior is still there. And then another quick example of permission abuse. This is not the game for Grand Theft Auto, but it's the walkthrough. So it teaches you all the cheats and how to play the game. Over 10,000 downloads before it was pulled from the market, but it requested over 50 permissions. I mean, it was just ridiculous out there. This next example is pretty fun. Anyone use Tinder? So popular dating app. No, no one has to admit to using it. But uh, terrible from a privacy perspective. It was transmitting exact geolocation over the network in the clear and complete details on the user. So when we pulled the, the back end or what the API was sharing over the air in the clear, it's sharing the birth date, the full birth date, so month, year, date, the full ID, the Facebook ID of the user, and the exact latitude, longitude. So now I know, okay, this user Amanda, this is her Facebook profile. Hello, Amanda. I can go find her uh, information on, on Facebook. I know exactly where she has logged in from. So from a stalker perspective, this is pretty scary. From a user perspective, I feel like it's a huge invasion of privacy. Um, so we made this public. We worked with Tinder, told them about it, wrote a, an article on it, and they said they fixed it, but the fix was still a fail. Let's see if we see why. Instead of giving exact geo coordinates, now they gave exact relative distance to 13 significant digits. Uh, what's the problem there? Well, if I brute forces, I can take one step to the left. Did I get closer or farther? Okay, one step to the right, and then eventually find the person. But with a few lines of code, I can just do the shortest path and find the exact distance to, or the exact location of that person just by knowing the relative distance as well. So it wasn't really a fix. We went back with them and they fixed it now again. Uh, but from a developer's perspective, if you need location, you can use obfuscation. You, can, you don't need location that precise uh, for anything, let alone for a dating app. Um, fail number four, using bad or no crypto. Postagram app lets you take pictures and create your own postcards. Great. You can send post postcards directly from your phone, any mailing address in the world. Pretty cool. But it's sending, all the, sending and storing all the private photos in unprotected open networks. So you can go in and just start surfing people's pictures, and pe picture, people's postcards on their website. Uh, again, not, not very good job there. And then Sign Easy, which you can sign any document directly from your iPhone or your iPad. Uh, sending passwords in clear text, storing files directly to Dropbox. So again, if your corporate users are signing corporate documents or confidential files on their iPhone or iPad, since the password's being sent in the clear, then anyone can log into their account and see all the documents that were signed. And that's, so that's data in motion without encryption, data at rest without encryption. The Starbucks coffee app you can use to order coffee 
and you can have your credit card there for auto load. It stores username and password in clear text on the device. So again, if you lose your device, someone could easily get that information for your Starbucks app, maybe order some coffee on your behalf. But worse, a lot of folks use the same password for their email than they do for other apps. So a weak password in one app could propagate to other applications as well. Final review for the cryptography. The three main things are not using encryption for data uh, transfer, not storing passwords correctly, uh, and then also not expiring auth tokens. Uh, th this was finally fixed by Facebook, uh, but originally Facebook was set to never expire. So if your auth token was compromised, you would lose access to Facebook, and you would lo lose access to every app that you can log into Facebook with. So that's a big issue there, with, especially with single sign-on. The final fail, uh, dirty laundry. Just a lot of developers have their design notes, maybe the meeting notes in the application itself, debug information, and forget to remove it when they publish the app to the App Store. So for Pandora, we were able to find, hey, this Casey dude is, we know everything about his workspace environment where all the file structures are. We were able to find him on LinkedIn as well. And we sent him a nice note to let him know and blacked out his face just to not embarrass him too much. But as developers as well, make sure that you don't dare air any dirty laundry especially from an internal corporate app that you build. Uh, that can give an attacker a, a, an insight into how to maybe get into your app or where how the app was built as well. Uh, so again, we talked about this slide earlier, but just a, a quick summary. Malware is less than half a percent of the apps out there. Yes, it's growing exponentially, as a lot of the AVs like to say, but so are good apps. Apps in general, the whole app ecosystem is growing exponentially. Malware as a percentage of the overall app market is not really growing that much. So while we do monitor it and we do keep an eye on, it's our responsibility to raise awareness of just apps in general, not just malware. So in terms of countermeasures, we take a look at proactive and reactive countermeasures. And while many of the enterprises are clearly aware of the threats that stem from jailbreak and rooting of devices, as Domingo stated, you know, there's just another layer of exposure, another layer for potential exfiltration uh, as it stems from apps. So when we take a look at a holistic mobile security strategy of both proactive and reactive countermeasures, and we take a look at, for example, uh, jailbreak and rooting, which you know, from a malicious app could you know, stem you know, from that, causing a jailbreak or a root, uh, one of the, the common things that we see is that a lot of enterprises want to detect uh, jailbreak or rooted devices uh, and then do some type of quarantine, which might selectively wipe the enterprise data or do a full wipe of the actual device. The drawback to that is that traditionally that requires a phone home. So you might have an MDM client that's running on the iOS or the Android device looking for the jailbreak or the rooting activity. And once it identifies that, uh, phones home to the MDM console to say, hey, I found a jailbroken device. I found, found a rooted device. Uh, I need to go ahead and send a selective wipe or a full wipe back to the device. But what happens when that network connectivity is severed? In the case of lost or stolen devices, it's quite possible that that device may fall off the network. And when it does, it can't phone home anymore. And thus, you can't perform the selective uh, or the full wipe on the device. So one of the things that we've added to our product is the ability for offline jailbreak and root detection. So in the event that the device is lost or stolen and falls off the network, or someone um, more nefarious takes that, chucks it in a Faraday bag, connects it to their laptop, and tries to sideload something, we now have added the ability for offline jailbreak and root detection without the need to phone home. And then as a result, we can still perform that selective or full wipe of the device if that's what the enterprise desires. So that's something that we've added, and I think we've gotten really good feedback from customers around that. Uh, how that relates back to what we're talking about in terms of apps, well, when we start to get down to the app level, we leverage um, what App Authority does in terms of their research and intelligence and leverage that to also trigger things as well within our console. So if you decide that you've got 
um, a threshold that if the app is above a certain risk level, if it is identified as malicious, things like that, and trying to be a little bit more proactive, that can cause various types of quarantine triggers within the console as well. Um, and then getting back to kind of where we started back at the beginning, um, also on the topic of apps, um, is related to something that came out in iOS 7, which is the ability to do a per-app VPN. Um, we at Mobile Iron had been previously doing what we call app tunnel uh, for both iOS uh, and Android um, to allow you to alternatively use kind of a per-app VPN instead of a full-blown VPN. Obviously, one of the arguable drawbacks to a VPN is the fact that you, know, you inadvertently, at least by default, are allowing everything on that device to access the corporate network when it VPNs in. So all those risky apps we talked about, any kind of malicious apps and so forth, might also have access to the corporate network. And obviously that's a bad thing. So by leveraging a per app VPN, like in the case of iOS 7, and terminating that using some kind of secure mobile gateway instead of uh, your VPN, uh, provides you that ability to say, no, I'm only gonna allow the apps that I permit, only the apps that I've permitted for the enterprise, and only if the device is in compliance, meaning it's not rooted, jailbroken, or otherwise. And thus provide a little bit better um, security around you know, fortifying that secure access to the corporate network. Uh, some of the other things are related uh, to apps where we talked about earlier in terms of some of the functionality. So controlling some of the intents as well. Maybe not on the entire device, but only for that portion or that secure persona on the device. So while you might have personal data as well as enterprise data on the same device, create some kind of separation with that data and those apps separate from the personal data such that if they want to perform a copy paste, screenshot, upload, open in, all those other types of behaviors or intents, if you will, control that, but not limit that for their personal stuff. You know, if they want to do that for the personal stuff, fine. But on the enterprise side, turn off some of that functionality so they can't share data outside of that secure persona. So that's exactly what we do here. So in terms of the device, securing a little bubble for the corporate content, apps, and web access, and then provide that secure access for a, via a per app VPN. So when we take a look at then um, kind of a holistic strategy in terms of proactive and reactive countermeasures, um, you know, if we've got an attacker that's trying to target the network or the device, leveraging certificates to basically thwart man-in-the-middle attacks. So if you're using signed certificates, including mutual authentication, where you have a client cert on the device itself, doing that mutual authentication to basically thwart man-in-the-middle attacks if people are going to be connecting to open Wi-Fi, which we know they're going to do, right? Then some enforcement policies and lockdowns and restrictions, maybe not for the entire device, but at least for the enterprise data in the separated portion of the device. And in the event that the device does become compromised, falls out of compliance, or is infected with malware, ensure that we've got some method of detection and closed loop compliance actions. If we identify a malicious app, alert on it. If we see a subsequent jailbreak or root, quarantine the device. That includes that offline jailbreak and rooting activity we talked about earlier. And then from there, we can either remove the corporate app and or the data to basically mitigate that data exposure. So yeah, in general, from a takeaway perspective, there's a lot of talk about BYOD and bring your own device in the enterprise. But really, the devices part has been, that beast I think has been tamed, or at least there's technology around that. But the new question is, what do we do about bring your own apps, bring your own risky apps as well? Uh, when apps are being created by developers all over the world, it's incredibly fragmented. Five years ago, most of the software in the enterprise came from Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, Adobe, at least some names, maybe not trusted, but names that the co companies were familiar with. Now apps are coming from OMG Pop and Zynga and King.com and all kinds of uh, developers. 
So these developers might not have the same expertise in building software, yet we're using them in a corporate environment and we're accessing, accessing corporate networks and corporate uh, frameworks. Uh, there's majority, there's more risk than just malware. So part of that is just education from a user perspective. Uh, we forget that these are computers as well in our pockets. With laptops and desktops, at least some of our users learn not to open executables, not to open email attachments from folks they don't know. But with applications, we just download anything, accept any permission, just click yes, 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 give me the app. Um, that requires a little bit of re-education from a user perspective, but also from our security professional's perspective of what we can do about it. Uh, BYOA really leaves a threat to not just the user's data, but also the corporate data. So it's not us, uh, us versus them, IT versus the users. It's our calendars have personal data. We care if they get leaked out. It has corporate data as well, our address books as well. So how can we, with education and, and app analysis automatically, provide these kind of reports to users so they make better decisions? And it's more than just a user. It's posing a risk to the device and to the network as well. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, a lot of our enterprise customers, including the government, do have a lot of concerns around the uh, data leakage or data loss around PII information uh, and are revising their policies to incorporate that. So uh, when we take a look at all the layers of defense that we provide, both in terms of proactive and reactive countermeasures, you know, it's, it's really kind of understanding a lot of those threats that stem from apps. Um, if you want to do your own testing, I outlined a few, you know, simple uh, tools and techniques at the beginning, but certainly you're not going to be able to do that across the enterprise. And therefore, that's kind of, you know, in terms of what AppThority does in, in all their analysis of 2.5 million plus apps across Google Play and uh, the App Store is really kind of leveraging that intelligence to provide yet another layer of defense in that layered security model. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, by combining those, really providing those proactive and reactive countermeasures. Didn't have a lot of time to get into that one slide where I kind of outlined a lot of proactive and reactive countermeasures, but we did kind of uh, show that more from a flow diagram in terms of some of the threats and then a lot of the different countermeasures that you could use. So with that, we have a few minutes for questions and again, sharing our, informa our information in case there's questions after the fact as well. Anyone have any questions? My company is most likely going to deploy Mobile Iron uh, probably first quarter next year for approximately 3,000 devices. Are you familiar with Canvas fingerprinting? Um, sorry, it's hard to hear Canvas, you Canvas fingerprinting? Uh, yeah, a little bit. What kind of questions did you so have? So my question about? was when you're traversing the internet, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's a technology that when you go to a website with a device, whether it be a computer or a mobile device, your device creates a, a picture. It's the same picture for, it's the same picture, but every device that accesses that particular website makes the picture a little bit differently than another device. That allows them to identify you. It creates a, an identifier for you, and then therefore they know who you are. So my question is, is there, is there any plans, or maybe not at this point, but um, to basically mask your identity when you're traversing the internet on a mobile iron platform because for a company or even for an individual, the more that they learn where you're traversing and they're sharing data, it's no more than like having a cookie on your computer right. on, your, on your phone. Yeah, it's a great question and there's, there's not, you know, not always a silver bullet for all of it. Um, for those paranoid customers that would rather not share that kind of information, um, we, we kind of use techniques that are a little bit different in iOS versus Android. So, um, for example, um, if you're going to use uh, um, some kind of kiosk mode or uh, Samsung Knox, which is now morphing with Android and L and all that, um, there's, there's certainly some steps that you could take. Um, and the other question I would ask is, you know, are they just on the Wi-Fi or are they, you know, cellular-based devices as well? So, you know, on the corporate network, we do find that some organizations are, are leveraging filters for things, as, as Domingo mentioned, for Dropbox and things like that, but also, you know, some other uploads. So, again, kind of a, a layered defense. I don't think that there's, at least I'm not aware of, that we have a silver bullet for something like that today. 
Um, that's something I could definitely ask our engineering to see if it's something that they're already uh, testing and or developing in-house. The short answer is I don't know if that's something that, that we have as sort of a silver bullet, but I know in terms of um, data loss, you know, we've kind of got a number of techniques we can do to kind of thwart some of that activity. So, someone else had a question too. Yeah, that gentleman. Yeah, I was just asking a question about the, the demo that you did. What actual exploit were you using? Was it the DEF CON one from last year that stole Google creds? Because I noticed you only demonstrated the Google account, but not, you mentioned you also got you know, all the other ones. Is there something else? It that? wasn't Google specific. So it was from the device getting those accounts, getting the tokens, uh, so the full string for the, for the login. If you're doing within a quick window, those haven't expired yet. So even from another device, that same token is going through. So it was simpler than the, than the hack from last year that affected Google. It's just taking those credentials uh, from the leveraging as if you were back on the device, just logging, clicking the Google app again. It's thinking it's the same communication port. Was the original app rooted? Uh, it can be rooted. It doesn't have to be rooted for some of the accounts. For Google, it has to be rooted, yes. For the other gentleman's question, um, one other thing came to mind. Um, what some of our customers are doing are, is taking one of two techniques for that. So if they're looking to further filter that or control that, um, traditionally people, like in the case of iOS, for example, would use some of the proxying redirect capabilities. So although uh, that may be a device, you know, maybe a phone that's on a cell network, it may sometimes be on the corporate Wi-Fi, but many times is not, um, they're redirecting that traffic into the corporate network before it then goes out to its, you know, final destination. Um, in terms of what we do on our secure mobile gateway um, is uh, with the, the per app VPN capabilities or the tunnel capabilities, um, some of our customers are also redirecting the traffic via that mechanism into the internal network so they can then filter it outbound as well. So that might provide an additional layer of defense you could use for that. And some of our financial services customers um, are definitely using it and have found it really, really valuable. So Probably have time for one more question. Or not. Thank you, for everybody. Thank you. We've got some really cool blogs on the mobileiron.com site around some man-in-the-middle attacks and uh, the iOS attachment vulnerability and some of the other stuff that um, we kind of touched on today. So definitely check that out at mobileiron.com if you like some of that hacker demo type stuff. And uh, thanks for your time today. And authority.com, we have some blogs as well on the application side, uh, including a faulty third-party SDK for an advertising perspective that can be used as a command and control bot uh, over unsuspecting Android users. So check that out. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys.